You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is not just a character in the Word of God. He is the subject of the Word of God. He is the theme of the Word of God. Everything uh, in the Scriptures all points to Him. And if we were preaching about Joseph, we could talk about the type of Christ that we see in Joseph. If we were talking about David, we could talk about the type of Christ that we see in David. But we're seeing here with Isaac, and this is especially with his birth, one of the pictures of the Lord Jesus. And we see that right here. And so as we come to the Lord's table tonight, I want to just zero in on the Lord Jesus Christ as seen in the picture of Isaac here uh, in Genesis 21. And so uh, we see how he's foreshadowed. In fact, there's nine different ways. There's nine points. So buckle up. Nine points tonight, and uh, we'll be through before midnight. There's no doubt about that. And we don't have any windows you can sit in, so you don't have to fear. But uh, praise the Lord, right? But I want to see, and there's more than that. You know, we could talk about Isaac when he gets his bride and how uh, the servant was sent to get a bride for Isaac. Boy, uh, the Holy Spirit of God is using us to gather a bride, isn't uh, for the Lord Jesus. So there, there's more than what we're going to see here. Uh, there's always more with the Word of God. Uh, but we have a remarkable Savior. And what a miracle the Lord Jesus Christ is and His salvation is. And all the way through the Scriptures, it's just over and over that God just pointed out what a miraculous Savior we have. What a miraculous God. And uh, this is not something anyone could have dreamed up or, or made up. Uh, this is supernatural through and through. And so Genesis 21, we'll just read the first seven verses here. We're focusing on the birth specifically. The Bible says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And I just want to think of this thought, Christ in Isaac. Christ in Isaac. What a picture, what a type. Let's pray together. Lord, help us now as we see you all the way through the scriptures. Lord, every page we turn to this book, we find you. We find you over and over again. And Lord, may we not miss in the word of God, the subject is not about Isaac or even Abraham or Sarah or Hagar. Lord, the subject is you. And all these people help us know more of how you deal with your people. And Lord, what you want us to see of who you are. And so open our eyes, we pray, to behold wondrous things out of thy law tonight. If there's one lost that they would see uh, through the word of God, the wonderful love of the Lord Jesus and how you came for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to call your attention uh, to the remarkable comparison between the birth of Isaac and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And number one, we'll see, first of all, both births had been promised. Both births had been promised. We see right here in verse 1 and 2, we just read how the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. And we can, of course, go back in uh, 25 years before that God had promised he would make him a great nation. God had promised that he would uh, give him a son. And, and God called him out of the earth of Chaldees at 75 and said, I'm going to give you a son and then later to you and Sarah, and, and it's going to be from Sarah. He, he gave him more information about it. But now 25 years have gone by. And God has made good now on his promise here. And God said, of course, to the nation of Israel, and we could go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. But we see it all the way through the Old Testament that God was going to send the Lord Jesus Christ, a Messiah, a promised one. And we could talk about Exodus and every lamb that all of it pictured the Lord Jesus that would come. But we know in Isaiah 7, 14, very specific, God said to the nation of Israel, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And when the day that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. So both births had been promised. Number two, we see both births had a long interval between the promise and the fulfillment. 
a long interval between the promise and the fulfillment. Actually, about 25 years, like I said, when it comes to Isaac and with the birth of Christ, you could go back many generations. And uh, if you speak looking specifically that it was going to come through David's line, God had promised a thousand years before Christ was born. And so both of them had a long time, lots of faith and waiting on God between the promise and the fulfillment. Number three, we see both births when announced seemed impossible. It is interesting as you start looking at the births of, that God uh, brings out that were miraculous birth, God was almost, if you will, preparing our minds to understand that God can do anything and especially when it comes to the birth of a, 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 a promised child. We think of Samson was a miraculous birth and John the Baptist was a miraculous birth. And obviously here, Abraham was, uh, Isaac was a miraculous birth. And so, uh, but these both seemed impossible, incredulous, it couldn't happen to both Sarah and Mary. Uh, you'll recall when the Lord uh, told and visited Abraham there on their way to Sodom and told him, he said, where's Sarah? And, and, and said, she's gonna have a child. And remember, Sarah laughed and, and, uh, and the Lord said, she laughed, and of course she argued about that, but it just seemed impossible. It couldn't happen. This thing can't be, it's beyond belief. Uh, the deadness of Sarah's womb, I mean, it was past time, couldn't happen, humanly speaking. And then of course we know in Luke chapter one, when the Lord uh, sent his angel there to Mary, it was Mary that brought up the question, how, how, how can this be? How can this be? Luke 134 then said Mary to the angel, how shall this be? Seeing I know not a man and I love this passage. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived. Here's another miracle one, John the Baptist in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren for with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Oh, I love that. Lord, I'll take your will. Thank you. Whatever you want. And the angel departed from her. And so uh, third, we see that both of their births seemed impossible. Uh, number four, both were named before their births. Verse number three, the Bible says, and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bared him, Isaac. Isaac. But remember, God had told them what their name, his name was going to be before that. Genesis 17, if you want to back up there to Genesis 17 and verse 19, the Bible says, And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and his seed after him. Of course, we know about the birth of the Lord Jesus there. And we find in Matthew 1, verse 21, the angel said to Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And so both were named before they were born. And number five, uh, both births occurred at God's appointed time. We read in verse two where it says, and Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time. That God is a God of timing, isn't he? And the Bible says at the right time that the Lord Jesus came and, and God always moves it at, at just the perfect time. And he is a God that is not late. He doesn't show up early. He's always right on time. And you can trust that the Lord is going to be there on time. Praise the Lord for that. His timing's perfect. And so Sarah brought forth Isaac right on time. And of course, regarding the birth of Jesus, Paul would write in Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. So both births occurred at God's appointed time. Number six, both births were miraculous. Both miraculous. The, the birth of Isaac was a miraculous birth. Certainly the birth of the Lord Jesus was miraculous. No man had any part in it at all. It was something of God. As we already read in Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is God with us. No man had any part in that birth. It was miraculous. Mary brought forth what God sent forth. Then number seven, both sons were a particular joy to their father. 
both sons. Verse three, the Bible says Abraham called his name, the name of his son that was born to him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac, Isaac. And we read that Abraham called him Isaac because when the Lord began to tell him about this son, remember he laughed. And of course we know Sarah laughed in unbelief, but he brought such joy and he brought laughter. His name Isaac, every time they heard Isaac, he brought laughter. That's what it, Isaac means. Now, this was the name he gave his son because he laughed in sheer joy at the announcement that God was going to give him one from Sarah. Referring to the Lord Jesus, of course, we read at his baptism, the father, remember, spoke out of heaven. This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. What joy they brought the father. Both sons were a joy uh, to their father. Then number eight, we see both sons were obedient to their fathers, even unto death. Both sons were obedient to their fathers, even unto death. In chapter 22, we'll get there soon in Genesis. We're going to see that Isaac was offered up by his father. He was ready to give him as a sacrifice. The New Testament tells us, believing that, or counting that God was able to raise him even from the dead. And Isaac was obedient. Uh, it's interesting, J. Vernon McGee says about chapter 22, he says, Isaac was not a small boy of eight or nine years. Isaac just happened to be about 33 years old when this took place. And he was obedient to his father, even unto death. And so he wasn't a little child many times in the Bible stories. And you see pictures of it like he was a little boy. But he was actually, many believe, an adult and maybe uh, of, uh, even of that age of 33. Meaning Abraham was pretty old by this point. And uh, Isaac could have overpowered Abraham. He willingly, he was obedient even unto death. Certainly we know that the Lord Jesus was that way. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, thought not robbery equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in likeness of man. Being found in fashion of man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Praise the Lord. God exalted him highly above every name. And then number nine, the last way we see here, the miraculous birth of Isaac is a picture of the resurrection of Christ. Now, this is interesting to me. We've already noted what Paul said about it in Romans 4, 19. You remember, and be not weak in faith. Talk about Abraham. Be not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was 100 years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. What was he saying? He was saying, listen. There was death in Abraham. He was no longer able to have children. He was past that point. There was death in Sarah. Her womb no longer was able to bear children. The lady, she was past that point. And yet out of death, God brought forth life. And when you think of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, tonight we're observing his broken body and his shed blood for us. And the devil, as we heard Brother Miller talk about that, he thought, boy, we've won. Hey, we, we're taking him out here at the cross and, and, and they're, they're killing the, the, the promised seed, the Messiah, all through from this birth when, when Pharaoh tried to uh, kill, or uh, excuse me, Herod tried to kill all the babies. And, and, and back here, even in Abraham's day, with, with, before Isaac was born, with, in, in Abimelech trying to take Sarah and just all the way through, the devil is trying to prevent the Messiah from coming. And now he's come, and so finally we're going to kill him. We're going to take him out. But out of his death came life. Not just his life, the resurrection of him, but he the first to resurrect from the grave that we all now have life from death. Ye, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in, his, in your trespass and sin. What a Savior we have. And so out of death came life. After Paul emphasized this, he would go on to say there in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, who is talking about the Lord Jesus, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And so even uh, in Romans 4 there, he pulls out that uh, connection of, of Isaac and, and out of this deadness, Jesus' resurrection is pictured. So we have in Isaac 
a remarkable picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's more things, as I mentioned, but just specifically think about his birth. Our Lord Jesus Christ's life and death and resurrection for us is the climax of all human history. This is the climax of the word of God. This is what everything is pointing to. And I just want to stand in awe of the Lord's love for us. I mean, to think that from the foundation of the world, we heard Brother Miller, I don't know which services you were in, but he spoke about this, about how before creation, God knew man would sin. God knows everything. So they say, well, why did he put the tree in there, right? And why, why did he create Adam knowing he would sin? Because God gave us free will. He gave us a choice. There's no love without choice. You're captive if you don't have a choice. You choose to love. And there's a choice. But knowing, knowing that we would sin, he still made us. <laughs> Brother Miller asked the question to the young people there. And that, it was a Saturday morning session before the end service. And he asked them, what would you do if you made this thing out of the ground, out of dust and breathe through the breath of life and all that you did and then said, don't drink this one tree, but you eat everything else, enjoy everything else. And then they did exactly what you said not to do. You know, someone said, well, I'd destroy them. You know, I wanted to blurt out, I'd say, I'll take you out and make another one look just like you. You know, <laughs> he could have done that, but he didn't. Why? God says, the Lord Jesus is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Because he loves us, he didn't give up on us. Because he loves you and me, there was never a point where he said, you know what? I don't want people, I don't want mankind anymore. Or oh, he had to judge, he had to deal with things, but there always was a remnant that he said, I love them, I've set my love upon them. And God never wanted at ever any point uh, to be at enmity with us or have to judge us. No, he created us to walk with him in the Garden of Eden. That's what they did every day. That's what he desired, fellowship. Because of our sin, it brought the breaking of fellowship. It brought a, a wall between us and God. So what love we see in the Lord Jesus. What love we see in God's plan for you and I. And as we come to the Lord's table tonight, now this is not just a memory of the price paid for your salvation, but it's also a memory of the great love of God. That anyone would love you to that degree. We, we don't understand fully that love. I don't know that we ever will, even in heaven. But I know this, I don't know anyone else in my whole life that ever died for me. And even if someone had no one of this quality, no one of this caliber, no one of this with priceless royal blood, the King of kings and Lord of lords, he died for you, he died for me. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, your Savior tonight, I want you to know that God died in your place. It's not that he's willing to die. It's not that he would die if you want to be saved. He already has. He's already paid it in full as the choir sang tonight. And he's waiting with the offer. It's like the tickets purchased. Do you want to go on the trip? I mean, I've got it right here. I've already paid the price for it. It's non-refundable. All you have to do is receive it. The Bible says if we would repent of our sin, if we turn from our way, our sin, and turn to Christ, repent means to turn, a change of mind, to turn to the Lord tonight, he would receive you. He says, all that come to him, I'll know why it's cast out. He's calling, 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 calling. And just in case you missed it, the last chapter of the Bible, the Lord says, come. And the bride says, come. The church says, come. Hey, come all. Drink of the water of life freely. And so if you don't know Jesus tonight as Savior, before we think about this, there's no saving value in this. This is a memory. This is a picture. This only has significance if you've already received of the bread of life. If you've already drank of the water of life. If you already know that the living ones come to, in you. Otherwise, there's no saving value in this. Either way, there's no saving value, but there's no even significance for you except you've already trusted the Savior. If you don't know the Lord's Savior tonight, this would be a great time. Receive the Lord as your Savior. Let's bow our head in prayer.